Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Monday, February 20th edition of the Basement Academy. Uh, for those who were in worship yesterday at Greenwich or were joining us online, you, you heard me, of course, talk about uh, the Asbury Revival, and already this morning, and I'm at 727 right now, okay, 727 Monday morning, already into my news feed uh, have popped several um, stories, I guess, people covering this, and so it continues, the Asbury Revival, Awakening, Outpouring, in breaking of the kingdom uh, continues. And so let's pray uh, for our, our sisters and brothers there, both wh those who are being renewed and those who have responsibility to manage the campus. Um, it, it, one of the stories is it's becoming a challenge uh, with so many people, um, 10, 20,000 people descending upon this little sleepy two stoplight town. And let's pray that such a spirit of renewal would again come to our lives uh, and to our church and to our sister churches uh, in the community. So uh, to that end, let's begin with the Word of God, uh, with our morning psalm, again, and encourage that the daily praying of the psalms is a way of keeping us attentive and alert to God's presence and God's word and God's call on our lives. And so this is for the director of music. It is a Psalm of David. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. We will shout for joy when you are victorious and will lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. O oh Lord, save the king. Answer us when we call. Psalm 20. Mm. Love that psalm. May he give you the desire of your heart, not so much that I want a new car and I want a new house and I want new golf clubs. It's not that. It's may he give you desires. May God give to us desires for the kingdom. May God give us a desire for the things that he desires for us to walk in faith and hope and love and humility, that we would desire the fruit of the Spirit to be born in our lives. May he give you desires, the desires of our heart. So. Amen. Well, let's dive back in our essentials of the Reformed tradition. I think we're going to close out uh, our How Firm a Foundation reflection this week. Uh, to that end, uh, just a, an administrative note, I'm going to ask um, a Joy to put up on our church website a little box where you can submit questions. Just any question you want to ask about the things we've been talking about, about the church survey, about the Asbury Revival, just ask away. You know, I'm not going to be able to answer anything about macroeconomics, uh, though I do have a minor in economics. That was a few years ago, right? But, you know, any theological, biblical, practical, church-related question that you're curious about, I would love to take on. I think I'll start that next Monday uh, is, is the plan. Um, and so, or you can just email me directly. If you have my email address, just shoot it to me or office at greenwichprez.org. So anyway, lots of different ways you can submit the questions. I'll keep reminding you of that. So we are talking about these essential tenets, essentials of the Reformed faith, okay? So the, our particular Presbyterian Protestant Reformed tradition, there's some unique, uh, and, and this one we've been reflecting on is living in obedience to the word of God. Obedience is not optional. It is always presented to us in scripture as that which is necessary 
for a whole and just and mature and, and vibrant, flourishing, fruitful life. God made us to live in relationship with him and to do what he asks. And it did not happen in the beginning. And it set things in motion from there. And so reflecting on the commandments, let's say we're now at the fourth commandment, using the Ten Commandments as uh, an occasion for self-examination, confession, repentance, and leading us. So the Ten Commandments is like a fence to protect us. It's like a path to guide us. It's like a mirror to reveal ourselves to us. And so we're, we're looking at ourselves in the mirror of the Ten Commandments. And so our fourth item on our little essential tenets document Observe the Sabbath as a day of worship and rest, being faithful in gathering with the people of God. And so let me, let me read for you the, the fourth commandment, okay? And I'm going to read it in two different places. And so first out of Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, on it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That's the fourth commandment as recorded in Exodus chapter 20. But Moses restates the Ten Commandments for a new generation at the end of the 40 years wilderness wandering as moms and dads have, have died to the children who came out of Egypt. He restates the commandments and here is the fourth commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gate, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Interesting, okay? Rem okay so, so all that's virtually the same. Now, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Nothing about creation. In Exodus, the, the language is because the do, do your work for six days and on the seventh day rest because that's how God did it. In creation, God labored for six days, fashioning the, the heavens and the earth, and then he rested, so you rest. And so the, the reason for observing the, the Sabbath is linked to creation. Here in Deuteronomy, it doesn't say anything about creation. Remember, you were slaves. You didn't have a day off for however many hundreds of years, Right. You were slaves and the Lord God brought you out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, keep the Sabbath. And so instead of hooking Sabbath to creation, it hooks it to salvation or redemption. Interesting. Um, Eugene Peterson, some years ago, um, wrote an essay about Sabbath keeping, noting there that pastors are notoriously... Um, guilty of breaking and violating Sabbath keeping. You know, we work seven days a week and we get raises for it. We get honored. You know, we couldn't embezzle. We couldn't be adulterers. We couldn't be, you know, chronic liars <laughs> and the like, but we can break the Sabbath. And I do. And I ask your prayers. I'm, I'm in the midst of trying to regain one day off uh, a week. It's just, I'm, I've fallen into a bad habit. A lot going on at the church, and so invite your prayers for that. What Peterson says in this essay, after some, some confession, which I'm joining him in, <clears throat> I've got, if you're looking at the whiteboard, praying and playing. He says, what, what should characterize Sabbath observance is these two activities, the, the remembering the Creator, God rested, and so at the, at the end of creation, we pause, we rest, the end of our work week, and we remember God. We remember the Creator. We remember all that He's done. We remember His works. And so we give our attention in worship. We pray. 
and, and we worship and we, and we give uh, devotion and tribute to him. We speak our words, we hear his word. And, and so all that happens in the context of, of worship and gathered worship, summarized as praying, okay? But then Peterson plays off of this, this uh, Deuteronomy um, difference. Remember, you were slaves. You never had a day off. There was no rest. There was no recreation. There was no refreshment. Recreation, if you take that word apart, re-creation. Re-creation. Sabbath rest is a day where we are recreated. We remember that we are created, are praying, but then we remember that we are free. We were slaves. We were in chains. And for us, it, we haven't been enslaved, but enslaved to sin. And so the redemption of Jesus Christ. And so playing, that is joyful activities, gathering, that which brings joy to your heart, that which enables you to celebrate your freedom. That, that's the point that, that um, Peter's was trying to get at. So obviously there's a little bit of a word play here. Praying and playing should characterize our Sabbath rest. One day a week, typically for most uh, of the body of Christ, it's Sunday, right? We gather in worship. And then as the afternoon unfolds, taking a nap, going for a bike ride, going to the gym, golfing, whatever it might be. Now, former generations would have said, heavens no, you can't have fun on the Sabbath. That's breaking the Ten Commandments. And Peterson wrote this in response to such a narrow view of this. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, Jesus reminded and so he goes in there and he heals very intentionally on the Sabbath to set people free. And the Pharisees are enraged at him. So I don't know what your Sabbath purposes are, your, your Sabbath practices. I guess that's the better word. We ought not do the work that we do the rest of the week. Okay, we ought not do the work we do. The, whether it's working for pay, then you ought not do that work. Well, yeah, I, I, I can't. Then you're going to have to get all that work done in six days. And you're going to have to discipline yourself. And that's the challenge I'm running into right now. Um, if, you are not, if you're no longer working, you know, you may engage in certain kinds of activities. You know, you may, in, you know, that which is burdensome or um, you're obligated to during the week you may wish to not break free from that obligation. And so it could be things like this. This could be a Sabbath practice. If watching the news and getting all fired up and all upset and all mad because of what you hear on the news is what you do, don't listen to, don't watch the news on Sunday. Because you know when you watch it, you're just going to get all mad at those other people. And again, I don't care what site, what, what, you know, if you're watching MSNBC and CNN or you're watching Fox News, I don't care. You know, we watch news and usually the way journalism today, they poke at the other side, okay? So that would be an example of something you could do <laughs> as a Sabbath practice to create space where you give attention to God, you celebrate joyfully your freedom in Christ, enjoy a good meal. But if you're the one who typically prepares the meals in your household, don't you be the one to prepare the meal on the Sabbath. So it's like that, okay? I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, the, the other, the other uh, commandment here to give some attention to is the uh, fifth commandment, which is typically honor, well, it is honor your father and mother, but the, the way our uh, friends on the Essential Tenants document put this, give honor toward those set in authority over us and practice mutual submission within the community of the church. Give honor to those who are set in authority over us. And that begins with father and mother. And so honor your father and mother as the Lord has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. That's the way the, the commandment speaks, the fifth commandment. And so we live in an age where authority is often looked at as a bad thing. You're to question authority and reject authority. And of course, this is the legacy, sadly, of the human family who is taken of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I will become an authority unto myself. 
this is what sin does to us. I will have no one ruling over me. I will be independent. I'll be my own boss. I'll be my own king or queen of my own little uh, fiefdom here. And so God sets us in families. Ordinarily, we grow up with our biological mother and father uh, giving us guidance and instruction and discipline, faulted and flawed as they are, and their guidance was. It was given as best it could with love, uh, with intentionality, Um, Each of us has struggled, you know, at some point with our parents. And part of that's because we struggle with authority. We don't like being told what to do. The little child doesn't, no, mommy, no, daddy. You know, we tell the child, no, we set boundaries. (laughs) The child speaks back, says no to you. And then we become teenagers and we kind of want to get off the yoke of mom and dad. We're a little embarrassed to have them around. And we we want to be free from parental authority and we're going to, you know, align with our peer group and we're going to do things our way, okay? And so what the fifth commandment, the deeper abiding reality is authority is woven into, is built into the structure of life. Without structures of authority, we have anarchy, okay? If you don't have a mother and father guiding the home, the children run amok. If you don't have a teacher and a principal and others guiding the classroom and the school, if you don't have an umpire or referee guiding on the, um, on the, on the baseball field, if you don't have a conductor you know, conducting the choir, if you don't have police, <laughs> you know, this is why this, the, the, the defund the police movement is just crazy, you know, because who wants anarchy? It is anarchy when you have nobody set in charge. And so the the book of Judges ends this way. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. This is not heaven. This is hell, right? Yeah, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, wherever I want, with whomever I want, as long as I want, and you can't tell me. That's not a prescription for heaven. That's a prescription for hell. That is chaos. That is anarchy. And so... We rightly live ordered lives submitting to those placed in authority over us. Even within the church, there is authority. The elders give guidance. The pastors preach. The elders are the governing body of the church. We might not like all the decisions that come, but we're called into a submission to submit to those in authority over us. And so whether in the civil arena and the many structures we have in work, uh, and in schools and in libraries, the librarian says, shh, then you should shh, right? And, and so this is what is necessary for an ordered life. And God created us the way. He is the authority over us and he's placed mother and father and others so that we might ultimately learn to submit to him. Our submission and honor of God is expressed through our honor and submission to the authorities placed over us. And so we don't back away from that. In fact, we we lift this up in in our Reformed tradition. We recognize, well, I don't like the president and I don't like the laws they make. Well, okay. Didn't say you had to like it. You can work to change. You can vote and you can lobby and you can legislate and you can pass out flyers, you know. But at the end of the day, these are the laws. These are the policies of the land we live in, okay? And I'm not saying I like everything either. But there is something deeper about learning submission. And then this this language of mutual submission within the body of Christ. Give honor to those set in authority over us and practice mutual submission within the covenant, within the community of the church. And so Ephesians guides us this way. Uh, 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 I'm going to read, I was going to misquote it here. Ephesians, right at the end of Ephesians 5, 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Ephesians 5, 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And this is a, a general instruction Paul gives. And then he moves into the uh, arena of, uh, of marriage and, and, and family. And so it's honoring those in authority. It's honoring our sisters and brothers in the body of Christ. Um, let us consider their interests above our own, Paul writes in Philippians. It's not always what you want. In fact, what we want, we need to be weaned away from always getting what we want. 
the child who always gets what's he, what he wants or she wants grows up to be spoiled and becomes a headache and a pill for everybody there around. They don't know to how to handle no. The, the frustration that comes with being given some vitamin N. We talked about that. We heard that, that lesson uh, when we were young parents. Your children need lots of vitamin N to develop a threshold for frustration. We need to raise the threshold of frustration because when we don't get to do what we want, it's frustrating. I have a goal, I have a desire, I can't get there. And so this is part of what happens when, when people are indulged and they're not, a, you know, they don't meet a boundary that says you, you can't do this anymore. They get frustrated. Well, then when they get out into life and they don't have much of a tolerance for frustration, you see these outbursts of anger and violence. And I think that's part of what's plaguing our society is just a, a, a vitamin N deficiency. <laughs> People just haven't heard no uh, enough. And so <clears throat> examine yourself. What is your attitude towards authority? What is your attitude towards those within the body of Christ? And, you know, a, a decision gets made in this whole thing with the survey that we've got going. There's some challenge that's going to come our way, you know, when, when these results are read, um, somebody's going to be upset. If not, a bunch of somebody's are going to be upset. And so we're going to have to work that, that through together. And so we will practice mutual submission. We will listen to one another. We will honor one another. We will honor those set in, in authority over us. And so uh, let us examine ourselves with our Sabbath practices. Let us examine ourselves with our own attitudes and, 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 and practices uh, towards those in authority. And let us be guided well uh, by the, the Word of God, not by our own impulses and our own wants and wishes. And so it, 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 it uh, interestingly intersects. May he give you the desire of your heart. Well, that sounds like you get what you want. No, no, no. It's not that I get whatever I want. May he give you desires to honor the Sabbath and observe the Sabbath. May he give you a desire to honor those in authority. May he give you a desire to worship and gather and, and, to, and to stretch yourself. And if you haven't been in in-person worship for a while, come on back. It's safe. It's safe. Come on back. Uh, into worship, okay? So let's close here and we'll uh, pick up with the sixth commandment tomorrow, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you for this new day. Thank you for a call in the Psalms for a, a heart that desires what, what you desire for us. And so give us new desires and give us a desire to worship and to and to honor you on the Sabbath and give us a desire to be refreshed and renewed on the Sabbath day and give us a desire to honor those set in authority and give us a desire to honor our sisters and brothers in the body of Christ so that our lives would reflect the flourishing, fruitful, mature lives that you intend for us to live. And so we pray all of this in the name of the Savior Jesus who taught us to pray together saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God bless you with new desires for his kingdom, his glory, his power this day and forevermore. Amen.